Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. I want for a moment for us to clear our minds of the preceding months of this election. Instead of focusing on our political scene, I'd like us to cast our vision to Christ. And in he- instead of hearing a political speech, let's listen very carefully, not only to the words of the Word of God, but also the, the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I'd like to have a word of prayer, if we can, as we get started, and um, ask the Lord's blessing on our service today. Our Father, as we come this morning, I'm glad that you're the same God that you were last week, last month, last year, and last till the beginning of time. You never change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I pray for this service that you will Allow us to hear you loud and clearly. I pray for our current president today. Uh, He's gone through a lot in the last four years. He's fought for America. He's fought for the principles of the Constitution. He loves this land. He loves the people of this country. And I'm sure this time is very hard for him and his family. And so I pray that you'll put your hand of blessing on President Trump, Melania, the children, and the grandchildren. And I pray that you'll watch over them no matter how it comes out. Calm his spirit and help him to know that you're not through with him, that you still have a work for him to do, and may he be willing to do it. Now I pray that we'll give ourselves to you, that we'll listen carefully this morning, and that we'll go away rejoicing because of what we learn. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. We have, uh, we have fought, talked about the sermon that Jesus preached using parables. And we uh, have said how important it is not only to study the Word of God, but it's kind of important uh, to listen to what Jesus had to say himself. I don't know about you, but I would have loved to have been sitting on the front row, probably sitting on the ground, hopefully a little bit younger, when uh, Jesus preached this sermon. Wouldn't that be exciting? And one of these days we're going to hear him preach again. We have to understand that this is a very important thing. He spoke in parables, as we know, and he did that because he wanted to take a simple earthly story so that we could comprehend a spiritual, heavenly, eternal truth. Now, in every one of these parables, he's teaching us something that's not, it's not changeable. Governments change, right? People change. If you don't believe that, go home and look in the mirror. 
And, uh, but people change. Um, science changes. Pick up a science book from 50 years ago and you'll think it was written in the Dark Ages. Uh, but we, we can look at all these things and understand that some things change. The Word of God never changes. Amen. And these principles that Jesus is teaching us through the parables, even though they're earthly stories, are eternal principles. They don't change. Now, in our story today, and let me just sort of give you just sort of a, an overview so we can grab a hold of what Jesus is trying to teach us. Here's the story. A guy's out, he's walking around, he's, he's uh, going down little paths, and it kind of reminds me of my, my grandfather Ralston that was on my grandmother's, that was my grandmother's uh, father, and the, he lived on a farm kind of out from town, and, but town was close enough to walk to, and we did as kids walk into town every once in a while. But we would walk the different lanes, and we'd, some was his property, and some was someone else's property, and some was somebody else's property. And here's this guy just walking along, kind of looking at the land. And all of a sudden, he sees, maybe not like we see today, but he saw a little sign that said, for sale. He said, well, that's interesting. And so he said, well, let me go and kind of look around and see what kind of land this is. What, kind of, what, what can it produce? You know, is it going to produce cotton, or is it going to produce hay, or is it going to produce some kind of seed? Uh, what's it going to produce? And, and he kind of looked at it, and all of a sudden, he found something that was hiding. It had been hidden. There was probably a little, maybe a little stream over there, and, and some trees had grown up and there. Uh, I don't know. It didn't say that he dug for it. It just said he found it. It had been hidden, and he found it. And he said, Wow. Man, this makes his field pretty special. And so he went and he sold everything that he had to get the money to be able to buy the field. Now, he doesn't know whether the owner knew that that treasure was on the field or not. But he knew it. And he knew that if he bought that field, he would have something so much more than the field. And that was the story. You say, well, what in the world does it mean? Well, let's look at that. Now, there are, in each instance of the four parables that we've studied, and now this fifth study, we first of all learn that the field was the world, that the seed was sown in the world. So the field is humongous, right? It's the whole field. It's the whole world. It's all the nations. It's all the tribes. It's all the tongues. It's everything all across the world. The second story was not the whole field, not the whole world, but what it was, it was God's field. It was God's field. It was the kingdom of God. It was those that were saved. And an enemy came, who we know is Satan, and he planted what? Weeds or tares within God's field. It's not the world now. Because, you know, Satan didn't plant tares in the world. He planted tares in the work of God. You have to understand that. You say, I'll tell you what, I work with this horrendous guy. He's terrible. He's, he's, he doesn't love God. He, he hates the things of, he must be a terror. No, he's not. Unless he goes to church and tries to be a good guy. Okay? If he goes to church and tries to be a good guy, then he's a terror. But if he's just in the world and he's not in God's kingdom, then he's not, he's not a terror. Yeah. Tears happen inside God's field, okay? So this, this field is, is what? It's shrinking, is it not? Yeah. It's getting smaller, all right? Now, the third parable was the, the parable of the mustard seed. 
Now, how big was the field in the mustard seed? It was only big enough for the tree. Because a mustard seed was planted, and that was the extent of the field. And so we have this humongous tree, as we talked about, getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And so is the kingdom of God throughout the ages, right? You think there's more people that are saved and going to heaven now than when Jesus planted, the, when Jesus was the seed? Yeah. We're, we're a result of that. When we got saved, we're part of that tree. Okay, so the field is what? Going here, here, here. Now, the next parable was the seed of the, uh, or the, uh, um, the leaven, all right? So how much of the field was there? There was no field. It was what? It was just the result of the field in the, in the, uh, the kneading of the, the meal and the insertion of what? The leaven. So you see we're getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller that Jesus is teaching these eternal pr principles. Now, Today, we're back to a field. Now, we don't know how big this field was. Was it a quarter of an acre? Was it half an acre? Was it an acre? Was it, a, you know, 70 acres? Was it, was it 10 acres? You know, we, we don't know how big the field was. But the field is not the field. The story is the field, but the field is not the field. And so I want to talk about that today. What is the field and what is the treasure? You ready? Okay, let's go. Now, the treasure in the field. The Bible says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, which when a man hath found, he hideth. He found a hidden, tre <laughs> found a hidden treasure and hid it again. Uh, and, uh, and for joy thereof, goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. I'm going to give you three points of the seven today. I'll give you the rest next Sunday. You say, oh, we're going to get out real early. Well, maybe not. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah. The, the first point is the ultimate field. The ultimate field. Now, I want you to understand as we try to figure out what is the field, we have to understand that this field was available to everyone. It was available to all. Anybody that saw the sign could have what? Bought the field. That's interesting, isn't it? I mean, it wasn't just this one guy that passed that field. I'm probably sure that there were many people that passed the field. I mean, how many, how many times do we pass a sell, for sale sign, and we just drive past and have no interest and so forth. And so we, we, it, we're, it doesn't have that focus for us. We just go past it, and, and uh, I'll, we'll drive. Ruthie and I sometimes will just try to get out of the house for a little bit. We'll go out in the country and drive around, and sometimes you'll see a for sale sign. Well, because we're not interested in buying that piece of land, we just drive on by and... and uh, we may see another sign, may not, but it, was, but it was available to everybody and what? Anybody who wanted to buy that field. I think that's pretty exciting. Uh, and, and, and it's going to give us, these are, these are clues, guys, of what the field is. The second is it was available to inspect. Now, if we're, Carolyn, you know about this. Uh, if you're going to buy a house, what do you want to do? You want to inspect it, right? I mean, you know, it's sort of like uh, when, when, the, when, I, the, when the guy made the great feast and he sent out invitations to come and they all began to make excuse. And, and uh, I bought, I bought a, some cattle and I've got to go look at it. I bought some land, but I need to go. No, nobody does that. Either they or a representative will go and check it out. I want to inspect this thing. And so it is available for inspection. In fact, some, a lot of times anymore, we go even further than what we see because we want to know, well, how good is the foundation? Do they have any termites? 
That's a big deal today. Uh, get a termite inspection. Uh, does, the, does the heater work? Does the, the hot water heater work? Does the plumbing work? Or is there any leaks in the house? Uh, does, the air, does it have air conditioning? And if, if so, does the air conditioning work? work? Uh, is, is, it, is, is it like our building that moves every, every Sunday by the time we go and come back? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's all in perspection, and we want someone that has a clear eye to inspect that field. All right, you with me? That's another clue. The third clue, it was available to purchase. Uh, I, Ruthie and I, uh, we, we, uh, my son uh, has a house down not only here, but he has one down in Longview. Well, I used to pastor in Longview for about 10 years. And so, uh, not this weekend, but, but Friday and early Saturday, we went down to see him last last weekend, on Friday, Friday and Saturday. And so as we were going down, when we were coming back, there's a piece of land that I claimed a long time ago when I was pastoring in Longview that is going to be my millennial home. It's as, we're go as I'm going into Tyler, it's on a hill. It's on a hill. It is gorgeous. And it looks like from there you can see forever. And I said, when I come back in the millennium, I am going to claim that land <laughs> for mine. And so anyway, but you know, it's never been for sale. So uh, this, this property was for sale. It was not only available to everybody, anybody could come and inspect it, and anybody could come and buy it that wanted to. That's another clue. The second point, not only the ultimate field, and by the way, that is the ultimate field. It was a good field. It was a field that had a treasure. It was a field that was acceptable to the buyer. It was a field that was there ready to buy. The second is the ultimate opportunity. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hidden afield, the which when a man had found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Couple points. First of all, it would meet his desire for more than he had. It would meet his desire for more than he had. You know God put something inside us to have just a little bit more. And that's why the Lord has to remind us to be content with what he's given us. But this guy looked and said, man, I'd love to have that field. And there was this desire in him to be able to have, have this field. It's, it was more than he had, and it was great because it satisfied a longing in his soul to have more than he had. Now we have to take this and understand, that was the human part of this. But wait a minute, this is not a human story, this is a what? Spiritual story. So it would meet his desire to have more spiritually than what he had. Um, Brother Jim gave, uh, talked about uh, Brother Autry, one of our missionaries this morning, and a guy came by and, and uh, he had led to the Lord several years ago and he came by and, and he said, uh, you helped me out, you, you told me about Jesus, I got saved and that, that satisfied the longing of my soul, but he said, I need to talk to you because I want you, and he, and he had about a half an hour appointment, he said, I want you to teach me the Bible. <laughs> you know, every young Christian, every young Christian I've ever met 
said, well, somehow can't you just sort of take the top of my head off and take the Bible and stuff it all in there so I know what the Bible's talking about? Right? I know that when I got saved, I wanted to know the Bible. I wanted to get to know all the stuff about the Bible. I'd gone to Sunday school and I learned this and I learned that and I learned that. But when I got saved, I wanted to know the truths of the Word of God. Getting closer? The second thing, it would meet his desire to search the land. It would give him the desire to search the land. In other words, he said, I found one treasure. Maybe there's another treasure here. Maybe there's something else to discover. Jim, you just recently bought some land, and it's got a lot of trees on it. Do you know everything about that land? Not on your life. It's, it's a piece of property. You're going to go and look. You're going to go and search. You're going to go and say, hey, where's a good spot? Where's this and that? So forth. And you're, and you're on your land. So it, it met his desire to search the land, the field, the whole field. And then thirdly, it would meet his desire for all he wanted. Wouldn't it be nice to find something that would meet our desire for everything we wanted? Now think about it. Have you ever bought a car and you said, man, when I buy this car, I will never want another car in my life. And by the way, do you know what the loudest noise in the world is? The first scratch on your new car. Have we not all gotten something we thought would really satisfy us? But this field was going to satisfy all of his needs. He looked at it and he said this. It will meet my desire to fully live my life right here on this property. And by the way, do you know people used to buy land like that? They used to buy land like that, you know, when, when you could buy land for, you know, a couple hundred dollars or maybe even less than that, less than a hundred dollars an acre. And people would say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy this land and, and I'm going to, I, you know what I'm going to do? This, this is going to allow me to live my life. I'm going to build my, I'm going to build my house on the top of the hill there. And it's big enough, it's big enough so that when my children grow up, there's places for them to live on the same land. Now, that was free labor, you know, for farmers. That's why they had so many children. They needed enough girls to gather the eggs and, and plant stuff and then had the boys to, you know, milk the cows and, and you know, wrangle in the horses and all that stuff. But, but it will let me live my life right here. It will meet my need for life. Secondly, it'll meet my desire to be productive in this life. Now, my, my great-grandparents, both on both sides, were farmers. And I used to go when I was pretty young, uh, maybe four, five, six, seven, with my grandmother by train down to Missouri and to Kansas to visit the relatives. And it's just me and my grandma. We would, we would take off and go down, and, and we'd have a great time. And I love being on the farm. I, and I, when I grew up, I said, I think I'll be a farmer because, you know, when you, when you wake up in the morning, you're right there at work. You don't have to drive anywhere. You're right at work. And when it's time to eat, you don't have to go out to a restaurant. You just come right in, and there's this wonderful meal that's there. And you get fresh milk off the cow and, and all that stuff. You know, just, it was, I thought that would be so cool. And so here he is, his desire to be productive in his life. And you, know, you do know that the farmers in America feed the world. 
You know that, right? And so a farmer can be productive. You, you, know, you, you know sometimes why we get tired in our jobs? Because we don't feel like we're being productive. We don't feel like we have meaning. But for a farmer on a field, and the work, you know what? The work never stops. Those cows still need to be milked every morning. Those eggs need, still need to be picked up. Correct? And the next morning, here they come again. And they come again, and they come again, and they come again, and they come again. Every day, a farmer's life is a farmer's life. And so it met his desire to be productive in his life. He, met his desi- he would meet his desire to raise a family. To raise a family. Wasn't that a wonderful thing? And then, number four, it would meet his desire to pass the field to his children. You know, we used to have in America what was called, we would teach our children our trade and pass the business down to our kids. That was a wonderful time. It was a great connection between father, son, grandson, great-grandson, so forth. It was a wonderful time. So let's see what we've got so far. Let me throw something out at you and see what you think. What do you think the, what do you think the field is? What do you think the field is? Now, I'm not going to ask you to give the answer, but I'm going to throw out what I think it is. I think it's the Word of God. I think it's the Word of God. Now follow with me. Follow with me. Is the Word of God available to all? Yes. Is it available to inspect? You know, this book really was not designed to sit on the shelf. Right? Now I know that may come as a shock to you that you don't have to every Sunday morning dust it off so it looks like it's been used during the week. Um, and I know some of you use, use your computers now and your phones and whatever to read the Bible or you have a Bible that you're there. But it is, it's not only available to all, but it's available to inspect. You can inspect this book from Genesis 1-1 to the last chapter of Revelation. And if you want to, you can even look at the pictures in the back that are the maps. Is it available to purchase? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, if anybody here needs a Bible, we have one that you can purchase for nothing. Let me ask you a question. Would it meet our desires for more than we have? Yeah. Would it meet our desire to search the land? Absolutely. Brother Jim, you've been searching the land a lot and finding out where, where the children of Israel were when they moved the tabernacle and all the other stuff. I mean, you've searched the land. Is it, would it meet our desire for all that we would ever want? Absolutely. Uh, could we fully live our life on this Bible? Yeah. Could we desire for productivity in our life from the Word of God? Uh, Can you use this to raise your family? And could it meet our desire to pass it on to our children? I believe the field is the Word of God. Number three, the ultimate treasure. Well, you saw it. I thought the Bible was the ultimate treasure. No, not quite. In his search, 
in his search, he found the treasure. So what does that say to me? It says, if I begin to search the word of God, I'm going to find the treasure. You say, preacher, there's a treasure in here? I thought this was the treasure. No, there's a treasure in here. There's a treasure inside the word of God. Secondly, in his search, he found it worth more than his desires. The treasure will be more, will be worth more than our desires. The third thing, in his search, he found the true meaning of life. In his search, he found Jesus. He found Jesus. You know, there's a lot of people who have a Bible at home that are going to go to hell. There's a lot of people who come to church and the pastor doesn't open the Word of God anymore. He just gives you a pep talk for the week and he sends you on your way and many will die and go to hell. There are many people who read this book who have no clue of the treasure. There are people in universities that teach this book. Well, of course, they teach that Genesis isn't correct, and they teach that Jesus was just a good man. And by the way, let me just clear this out. If Jesus was not the Son of God, he was an imposter, a fake, a fraud, and you shouldn't listen to him. Because he said, I and the Father am one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And anybody, it's either, either Jesus is telling the truth or whoever you're listening to is telling the truth. If there's many ways to heaven, you're going to miss it. If there's one way to heaven, you'll find it. But it's Jesus. He found Jesus. In his search, he found it necessary to hide the treasure. So where did he hide it? David said, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Amen. You with me? Yes. Now, there, there's some great points, but here, here's what I want to end with today. And I want to show you something. But preacher, wait a minute. Is not this the written word and Jesus the living word? Yes, that's true. Okay? But you know, there's a lot of stuff in here. There's history in here. There's science in here. There's health guides in here. There's things that will help us. There's things that we're warned against that will hurt us. There's a lot of stuff in this book, right? But you see, you'll only find the treasure when you look for Jesus. In Genesis, Jesus is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's our Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's our great high priest. In Numbers, he's the pillar of fire by day and the pillar of, uh, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he's the commander of the Lord's army. In Judges, he's our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, he's the seed of David. In, our, in Kings and Chronicles, he's our reigning king. In Ezra, he is our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of everything that's broken. In Esther... He's our, he's our Mordecai. 
our advocate. In Job, he's our ever-living ever -living redeemer. In Psalms, he's our shepherd. In Proverbs, he's our wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he's the meaning for life. In Song of Solomon, he is the loving bridegroom. In Isaiah, he's the prince of peace. In Jeremiah and Lamentations, he's our weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he's our glorious Lord. In Daniel, he's the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In Hosea, he is the faithful husband. In Joel, he's the outpour of the Holy Spirit. In Amos, he's our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he's our judge and savior. In Jonah, he's our risen prophet. In, the, uh, he, uh, in Micah, he's the ruler of the world from Bethlehem. In Nahum, he's our stronghold. In Habakkuk, He's our watchman. In Zephaniah, he's our, the mighty to save. In Haggai, he's the restorer. In Zephaniah, he's the branch of David, the one pierced for us. In Malachi, he's the son of righteousness. In Matthew, he's the king of the Jews, the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God. In Mark, he's the servant and the miracle worker. In Luke, he's the baby in the manger, the son of man. In John, he's the son of God. The living word. The way, the truth, and the life. In Acts, he's our savior. He's the savior of the world. He's the ascended Lord. In Romans, he is the justifier. In 1 Corinthians, he's our resurrection. In 2 Corinthians, he's our comfort. In Galatians, he's our liberty. In Ephesians, he's the head of the church. In Philippians, he's our joy. In Colossians, he's our completeness and the glue that holds the world together. In First and Second Thessalonians, he's the coming king. In First and Second Timothy, he's our mediator. In Philemon, he's our benefactor. In Titus, he's the blessed hope. In Hebrews, he's our perfection. In James, he's the power behind our faith. In First and Second Peter, He's the chief shepherd and the chief cornerstone. In 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he is the truth and everlasting life. In Jude, he's the foundation of our faith, our security. In Revelation, he's the king of kings Amen. and the Lord of lords. Amen. He's the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's the keeper of creation, the creator of all. He is the architect of the universe and the manager of all times. He, is, he always was and always is and always will be. He's unmoved, unchangeable, undefeated, and never undone. Amen. He was bruised and brought healing. He was pierced and eased pain. He was persecuted and brought freedom. He was dead and brought life. He is risen and brings power. He reigns and brings peace. The world cannot understand him. The armies can't defeat him. The schools can't explain him. And the leaders can't ignore him. Herod couldn't kill him. The Pharisees couldn't confuse him. And the grave could not hold him. Nero could not crush him. Hitler could not silence him. Other religions cannot replace him. And the world can't explain him away. He is light, love, longevity, and Lord. He is goodness, kindness, gentleness, and God. He is holy, righteous, mighty, powerful, and pure. His ways are always right. His word is eternal. His will is unchanging. His mind is on us. His, he is my redeemer and my savior. He is my guide. He is my peace. He is my joy. He is my comfort. He is my Lord, and he rules my Amen. life. Amen. Jesus said, if a man gain the whole world, what shall he give for his soul? The truth is, Jesus should become more precious to us, more valuable to us. I love the song, More Than Wonderful. Jesus should become more than wonderful to us every 
day of our life. And I'm going to tell you something. I love the Bible. But let me tell you, I found the treasure in the Word of God. In His name is Jesus. When I get to heaven, I want to be able to pick Him out in the crowd. He won't be like any picture you've ever seen. He'll look differently than you've ever imagined. But I want to know him so well that if he knocked on my door, I would know by the knock to let him in. Jesus. What a wonderful treasure. Yes. Amen. You will Amen. never find anything more precious. No gold, no silver, no bullion, no diamonds worth more than the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And most of all, our Savior. Amen. Let's pray.